Okay, well, thank you so much, Dana. It's a pleasure to be here, and rarely do I get a chance to follow two absolutely uh, terrific presentations that laid great foundation of ketogenic diet research and science, so uh, it gives me a luxury to focus on some of the things that I often don't have time. So with that, um, the title of my talk today is Ketones from Toxic to Therapeutic to Ergogenic. And, you know, the, for many, that's a, a provocative title uh, because, unfortunately, ketones still have a very bad connotation. And, you know, this, uh, this really stems from their discovery, uh, which was they were found in the urine of type 1 diabetics who were uncontrolled. And that negative connotation of being in a diseased state uh, has just really lingered on, even to this day. I don't know, how many of you were taught ketones were toxic byproducts of fat metabolism? I mean, I think it's still in the textbooks, for crying out loud. It's, it's crazy we haven't updated this concept, and so there's still so much teaching and learning that needs to go on in the healthcare industry in terms of, um, you know, rehabbing the, uh, the, uh, the, the known facts about ketones. And it's really ironic because not only are they not toxic, now we're learning they're highly therapeutic and have so many applications in so many different chronic diseases. And even beyond that, what, what, what I find even potentially more exciting is that they're being used by athletes now uh, in many different sports and types of activities to enhance performance. So I want to give you a little flavor of, of, of different aspects of ketones that um, differ from your previous two talks, which kind of focused on epilepsy and cancer a bit more and talk about some of the other uh, applications. So here's what I'm going to talk about. And I thought I would at least start um, and, and talk a bit about the, the history of nutrition because, uh, you know, we have gone down a very bad path in terms of our dietary recommendations. And to be quite frank, it, I mean, I'm really angry that we haven't turn that ship around in terms of our guidelines in this country. I've spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill and talked with several dozen congressmen trying to inspire change there. And um, I leave every time quite depressed. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. But I love this quote from Charles Darwin, who says, to kill an heir is as good a service as and sometimes better than establishing of a new truth or fact. And I think recognizing we are going down the wrong path is, is really critical so that we can embrace some of these new ideas, um, especially in the area of ketogenic diets. So I'm gonna kind of skip through this fast, but I think a lot of you know the history um, where our guidelines started uh, in terms of the low fat paradigm and the Ansel Keys and the diet heart hypothesis and a lot of other factors that occurred over the last several decades that have really not changed much. I mean, if you look at the 2015 guidelines, it's the same paradigm of demonized saturated fat and, and still promoting relatively high carbohydrate diets. But um, you might find this interesting. If you look more specifically at sports nutrition guidelines, they actually parallel um, the dietary guidelines for Americans. It was back in the 60s and 70s that Scandinavian researchers uh, really discovered the importance of muscle glycogen, and that led to the development of carbohydrate loading. And that uh, led, in turn, to the formation of Gatorade and the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. And, Dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of scientists, sports scientists in particular, uh, made their career studying high carbohydrate diets and how carbohydrate supplements could enhance performance. But where does all this leave us? Um, well, we have an obesity and diabetes epidemic that's spreading across the planet like an uncontrolled plague. And we've got a lot of athletes, too, that are dissatisfied with their current diet. There's a lot of people who are just generally active and trying to stay healthy because they know exercise is good for them, but it's not 
it's, it's not preventing the weight from coming on. It's not preventing the diabetes from coming on. And they're increasingly turning to low carbohydrate, higher fat diets. And so in many ways, yeah, this is the world turned upside down. So the diet heart hypothesis, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, very simply um, went uh, like this. You, the idea was that if you overconsume fat, in particular saturated fat, it raise your cholesterol and raise your heart disease. And that's been the focus of our dietary policies in this country. It's been the cornerstone. And yet, despite billions of dollars spent on trying to prove this hypothesis, um, you know, it's got more holes than Swiss cheese. And it, but it, there's been unintended consequences of this obsession with fat in this country and decreasing fat. And that's resulted, in turn, with an overconsumption of carbohydrate. And it's this excessive amount of carbohydrate that people are eating that are leading to an alternative problem of metabolic syndrome or prediabetes, which puts a lot of people uh, on the fast path to developing type 2 diabetes, which in turn increases risk for heart disease. And then acutely, the more carbs you eat, the more you suppress your own body's ability to access and utilize fat for fuel. And that's a very... Um, highly evolved, highly conserved process that, that, that uh, is very, very um, prevalent. So the more carbs you eat, the more you inhibit your body's ability to burn fat. And that's the exact opposite that you should be striving for. So here's just an interesting um, graph on dietary patterns over the last several decades. And protein's been pretty constant. Fat, if anything, has gone down. So people have listened a little bit to the guides, guidelines. But clearly, the most salient change here has been a marked rise in dietary carbohydrate. And this isn't broccoli, cauliflower, and green beans. This is added sugars, right, and a lot of processed starches and grains and cereals. And that's, that's the driver. I mean, that's the primary cause of the obesity and diabetes epidemic. It, and it's probably driving cancer, too. Um, and, and to be quite honest, most non-commutable chronic disease. So uh, I'm most interested in diabetes, um, and this is partly why. Uh, this is a uh, most recent statistics on diabetes and prediabetes published in JAMA last year, and this is really astounding. Uh, it, it showed that one half of adults in the US have prediabetes. I mean, that is astounding, folks. Um, that means the average person now has prediabetes. This is the new normal. And it's not just the personal suffering that goes along with diabetes. Um, it's a huge economic cost. We spend $240 billion managing type 2 diabetes today. That's four or five times what we spend on cancer. It's about one fourth, one-fifth of our total health care budget. So that would bankrupt a lot of developing countries. And the general consensus among the, 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 the uh, health care industry and, and physicians is that diabetes is a chronic progressive disease, that it can't be cured, it can't be reversed. And that's clearly not the case. It's caused by overconsumption of carbohydrate. It can be reversed by bringing carbohydrate down into an appropriate range, which for many diabetics means a ketogenic diet. OK, well, let's look at a little metabolism here. So when, when we eat a typical meal that has carbohydrate in it, that meal may have easily 100 grams of carbs in it. Well, first of all, realize that's about 10 times what we have in our blood. We only have one to two teaspoons of, of blood sugar in it throughout our entire circulatory system. And so the, the body has ways to, to dispose of that glucose. And if you're processing that carb meal in a healthy way, the majority of that glucose gets taken up into skeletal muscle through an insulin-mediated process, and it's ox it gets oxidized eventually maybe temporarily stored as glycogen. But we have a finite capacity to store glycogen. So what happens if you're insulin resistant, though? 
I mean, one of the characteristics of insulin resistance, is really the primary characteristics by which many of the, the tests are based on, is, um, is insulin-mediated glucose uptake into cells. Uh, so if you can't get the glucose into muscle, where does it go? What other pathway can glucose be metabolized through? Well, the only other uh, pathway that glucose can be uh, metabolized is to fat. So that occurs in the liver. So if you're insulin resistant, and there's been very good work on this now, the majority of carbohydrate that you're consuming actually takes an alternative path where a pro greater proportion of it gets converted to fat through de novo lipogenesis. And it's not just any fat. The uh, end product of, of lipogenesis is palmitic acid, C16, or a saturated fat. And it gets packaged into a VLDL particle and released into the blood. And so you, what you see in type 2 diabetes and other uh, even milder forms, early stages of prediabetes, is you see not just higher triglycerides in the blood, but if you look at the composition of those uh, VLDL particles, they're enriched in saturated fatty acids. A lot of that gets desaturated to a uh, 16 one or palmitoleic acid, but you see this lipogenic fatty acid profile within the, the VLDL particles, and that is, a, is highly associated with, with risk for diabetes and other chronic problems. So um, again, my, my view of all this is, is most people are consuming carbohydrates above their tolerance, and there are a lot of different signs and symptoms of that. I won't go through each of these due to the time. But, uh, but there, if you have metabolic syndrome, that, you know, those are kind of your classic signs, you know, your, your excessive waist circumference, high triglycerides, low HDL, the atherogenic dyslipidemia, hypertension, et cetera. But there are other um, even subjective signs uh, that uh, would indicate you're over-consuming carbs. So, um, you know, if you look at the molecular details of insulin resistance, it's incredibly complex. Uh, and many scientists have made careers studying it. Uh, a lot of it focused on identifying the different mutations and different defects in the insulin signaling cascade. Um, but if anybody tells you they understand it or know the, the exact cause, they, they'd... Uh, they'd, uh, they'd be telling you a lie because it's an incredibly pleiotropic and, and, and very complex um, phenomenon. But what we know is that it manifests as a form of comp, um, carbohydrate intolerance. And that doesn't exist in a sort of binary state. It's a continuum where people on the far end of the spectrum um, that are carb tolerant may be able to to tolerate very low fat, high carbohydrate diets and remain insulin sensitive. And then there's other people at the other end of the continuum and a whole lot of people in between. And it even changes over the lifespan, such that uh, you, most of us, as we get older and enter into middle age and beyond, uh, tolerate carbs less effectively. So we're more carb intolerant. And what's neat is if you're burning fat, you don't rely on insulin. Burning fatty acids and ketones are insulin, independent of insulin. And there's a lot of reasons why humans evolved to burn fat. I mean, that's just a healthier fuel to be burning the vast majority of time. And the more carbs you eat, the more you inhibit fat burning, and you become dependent on carbs as your primary fuel source. And as you've heard about today, one of the fundamental adaptations of a ketogenic diet is you become very proficient at burning fatty acids and ketones. And I just want to kind of put a, uh, you know, a highlight on that because there is nothing that even comes close to a ketogenic diet in terms of enhancing the body's ability to burn fat and ketones, whether you're a type 2 diabetic or whether you're an elite endurance athlete. You can dramatically elevate your body's ability to burn fat. So this is, a, this is the you know, most robust stimulus that, that you can switch your body's fuel use over. 
And this process is a very elegant system the body has developed uh, to uh, be able to maintain perfect inner organ fuel exchange in the context of low carbohydrate availability. This, this, the term I like to use is keto adaptation to describe this, this very sophisticated, highly evolved process of switching all the cellular machinery over to uh, being able to accommodate fatty acid as the primary fuel in ketones. And we know that there's a lot of health benefits associated with keto adaptation. Um, I think di type 2 diabetes, to me, is the low-hanging fruit. Um, it's, it can be reversed with a ketogenic diet. Obesity um, is much easier to manage with a ketogenic diet. But um, there may be many other um, chronic diseases as well that extend beyond uh, those. And of, and, of course, cancer is, is the one I think a lot of people are focused on and other neurological conditions. But at the very other end of the spectrum, um, we're seeing increasingly uh, athletes adopt this approach with, uh, with quite a bit of success. So what is a ketogenic diet? You've heard a couple different ways to describe that. Uh, so I put a, this slide together to help people understand how it differs from other low carbohydrate diets. So it is low in carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are probably the, the, the primary macronutrient that drives ketosis. But protein is also uh, anti-ketogenic. So a ketogenic diet is limited in carbs and protein. Fat doesn't really factor in that much in terms of inducing ketosis. So fat can be high, it can be low, it can be moderate, depending on if weight loss or weight maintenance is, is desired. Uh, so, you know, the paleo diet, which is very popular now, is generally not ketogenic. It's too high in carbs and too high in protein. And you've heard also the ketogenic diet is not as restrictive, perhaps, as, as commonly thought. Um, and I would also want to just highlight that point because uh, I, I would even go as far to say it's pleasurable. Uh, that I, I work with a lot of folks who want to be on a ketogenic diet just because it tastes better. We do a lot of very highly controlled feeding studies in my lab where we take people through months of different diets, providing all the food, and they, the vast majority of them prefer a ketogenic diet over a high carbohydrate diet. So it can be very palatable, very pleasurable, um, and certainly if you need to be calorically restricted, it's a lot easier to lose weight on a ketogenic diet because of this, it's, it's very satiating. What does a ketogenic diet look like in terms of macronutrients? If you're eating to energy expenditure here, it's, it's 5%, maybe up to 10% if you're calorically restricted. Um, and here's where those carbs come from. Uh, there's not a lot of room here for pastas and cereals and sweets and so forth. Um, but it is important in terms of a well-formulated ketogenic diet to make sure you're getting adequate vegetables. There's, there's multiple reasons for that. Um, so you're gonna get five or 10 to 15 grams of, of carbs from, from non-starchy vegetables and one or two ounces of nuts will give another five, 10 grams. And even some berry fruits or avocados, tomatoes, or botanically fruits um, can work within a ketogenic diet. So right there, you're getting up to the, to the limit for most people in terms of what induces ketosis. Um, but this is something that's highly variable. Uh, some of the athletes can be eating 80 grams of carbs and still maintain nutritional ketosis, whereas the diabetics need to be generally closer to 30 or 35 or 40 grams of carbs. So it's really important, in my opinion, to measure, measure ketones in folks so they know uh, because there's no magic number here that works across the board. So I can probably skip through most of the terms here. Uh, you all know, I think, the process of ketosis, but I might just kind of describe it in a slightly different way. Um, you know, ketosis is ancient, um, and it was so important during evolution, as Angela mentioned. Um, you know, and the way I think about it is, we basically are all sitting here. We have this 
ketosis program within our liver. It's kind of like a software program that's just been sitting there dormant. And it only gets reawoken or boot up, it boots up when we restrict carbohydrates. And the beauty is um, almost everyone, in almost everyone, this program is perfectly functional. Even in a type two diabetic, when you get their carbs and protein in the right range, this program reawakens. And, uh, and so it's a highly conserved program, you know, and I think that again goes back to its evolutionary roots in terms of being very important. And when we were on the Serengeti to be able to have a fuel source when we weren't eating um, perhaps for several weeks or months and, uh, and ketones um, played that role and they also allowed the brains to develop. I like to use the words nutritional ketosis to define um, the level of ketones achieved when you're on a ketogenic diet, and I'll talk about levels in a second, and keto adaptation, which is more the process of, of adapting to being in a state of nutritional ketosis over consecutive weeks. And this is very, all very different than ketoacidosis, which is in fact a dangerous, life-threatening condition. But um, for anyone who doesn't have type 1 diabetes, ketoacidosis is not really a, a concern at all. Uh, if you even uh, basal levels of insulin will prevent ketoacidosis from occurring in anyone. So the real key here is the numbers. If you're eating carbs um, anywhere you know, above 50 grams of carbs for most people, um, you're, on, you're likely, your ketones are not more than 0.2, maybe 0.1 millimolar in the blood. They might creep up a tad bit higher after an overnight fast. But nutritional ketosis is in whole, an entire order of magnitude higher. So going from 0.1 to 1 millimolar, um, and that may extend up to 3, 4 millimolar. So that's the range of nutritional ketosis. And to put that in perspective, that's an entire order of magnitude lower than what you see in nutritional ketosis. So you know, to kind of put this in perspective, I like to use rainfall. So if you've got 0.1 ketones, that's like a drought. And you know, it's not gonna be good on the crops. Nutritional ketosis is an adequate amount of rain that everything flourishes. Ketoacidosis is like a tsunami, and, and that is a problem. But it, again, this is, only occurs if you're insulin insufficient. And, uh, and so if, that is important if you're working with type 1 diabetics and you need to know how to manage that. Uh, but even a ketogenic diet does work in type 1 diabetics uh, in terms of reducing the levels of insulin required and so forth. Um, so Angela showed you this, the brain is not a glucose dependent organ. I guess it is if you, if you eat carbs and you're not in ketosis, but when you're in ketosis, the brain can extract about two thirds of its energy from ketones. And that affords this absolutely spectacular protection from low blood sugar. I mean, this was just an amazing experiment as Angela so eloquently stated, um, that these people had no signs or symptoms of low blood sugar when they're, um, blood sugars plummeted to below 20 milligrams per deciliter in some people. So all that was worked out too, you know, what, 50 years ago. That was done by George Cahill back in the 60s. Uh, it just hasn't made it into the textbooks and it's not taught. Um, but that metabolic role of ketones is very well described by that elegant work that, that he did and others. What's newer and, and, and equally exciting about ketones is, is, is really over the last three years maybe, we've, we've learned about ketones, in particular beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the primary circulating ketone, um, as an epigenetic modulator of gene expression and, 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 an, and a signaling agent. So this was worked out initially by uh, Eric Verdon's group out at Gladstone uh, in a science paper. So it, it was a, obviously a very high quality work. They worked out the mechanism of HDAC inhibition and showing an, an increase in 
a whole array of antioxidant genes, as well as, at the tissue level, protection from oxidative stress resulting from being in a state of ketosis. And these weren't physiolo unphysiologic um, levels of ketones. This was within the range of nutritional ketosis that their experiments showed this HDAC inhibition. And folks, there are a lot of pharmaceutical companies chasing HDAC inhibition. I mean, if, 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 the, if any drug company had uh, a, uh, you know, a compound that was as potent as beta-hydroxybutyrate producing and uh, inhibiting HDAC, they'd have a blockbuster on their hands. But here we have a natural metabolite that we can produce during um, the process of ketosis. And, and it's, it's your liver producing it. You don't have to pay a pharmaceutical company high, you know, high amounts of money. You can produce it yourself. So this is really fascinating how we're using nutrition as medicine here, literally. And so this has brought on this whole new concept of beta-hydroxybutyrate as being more than a metabolite. I think the, you know, the metabolic roles are fascinating of how it's an alternative you know, source of fuel for the brain, um, but this, now we have this whole range of non-metabolic effects. And it's not just the HDAC inhibition. Um, as Angela mentioned, there's great work um, showing that ketogenic diets are anti-inflammatory, and we hadn't really understood the mechanism of, of that effect, but now we have some clues. Um, and and we, we see here that beta-hydroxybutyrate blocks the NLRP3 inflammasome. There's also a lot of interest in ketones um, as longevity uh, met metabolite. And uh, this work is pretty new, but there's been at least a couple papers published in the last couple years showing uh, life extension with a ketogenic diet. One of those was in C. elegans, which is quite common model system for studying longevity, where they showed the, these worms lived 26% longer when they were fed ketones. Another was an accelerated um, model of aging. In a, it was a mouse model. But I'm personally aware of, of some work going out in California in two different groups that were just using normal mice. They started these experiments about two years ago, and they're, um, and they're showing extraordinary effects of a ketogenic diet. In fact, the, they thought they would be done with the experiments by now, but they're waiting for these mice on the ketogenic diet to die. Oh, I do have a slide on this as well here. So this, they presented, one group presented this uh, as an abstract at a meeting recently. And, and a lot of the cellular, the cell signaling um, effects uh, ha have been worked out, you know, in terms of um, extending life with all the caloric restriction work. And it's turning out that a ketogenic diet phenocopies a lot of the same effects that have been identified through the caloric restriction literature. So um, this is pretty exciting because now you don't need to restrict calories in order to potentially get the life extension effects. So stay tuned here. I think it, it probably in 2017, maybe even early 2017, you will see some papers published um, on, the long, on longevity effects of ketones. Well, you know, a lot of the, the work done in uh, ketogenic diets, if you look in the literature, um, besides the epilepsy field that has a lot, of, a lot of papers, has been in obesity. And a lot of this um, was done back in, prior to 1970. There was a lot of positive momentum, and then as soon as the whole Ansel Keys low-fat paradigm came in, pff, nothing published in the 70s, 80s, 90s with a few, few exceptions. But there was a resurgence starting in about 2000. So we're now wrapping up a decade and a half of really exciting research on ketogenic diets and obesity. And I just put this slide together to, to show three meta-analysis that have been done uh, and published in the last couple years. The, the PLOS One paper there is the most recent, I think. And all of these meta-analysis, now we've got not two, not 10, we've got hundreds of studies now on low carbohydrate ketogenic diets and obesity. And they all show low carb diets do better than low fat diets. 
and usually remarkably so. And this is despite a lot of the flaws in the way these studies were carried out in terms of dietary compliance and dietary formulations. They weren't always ideal because a lot of times they set out to trash the diet, I think. So there wasn't a lot of support for these diets. Despite that, they, they usually come out on top. But I think weight loss is the tip of the iceberg. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, one of the real problems is diabetes. And we've had some clues in the literature. Um, you know, well, shoot, first of all, uh, before we, we were using insulin to manage diabetes, the, the standard of care was to use a low-carbohydrate diet. And then we have insulin, and we're like, well, I guess we've got to provide enough carbs to deal with the medication we're providing these folks. So it's just insanity. But, um, but here we have, this was 20 years ago now, published. Um, well, actually, no, this is the Bowden study. So this was um, 10, 10, 11 years ago. Um, there's at least a couple of these very well-controlled, short-term inpatient studies that looked at a ketogenic diet and type 2 diabetics and show absolutely remarkable effects, which occur very quickly in a matter of weeks. And, uh, and so uh, here showing 75% improvement in insulin sensitivity, and that's you know, using the clamp technique um, to document that. And of course, now the, probably the most common criticism or feedback I get is that, well, that's great, you know, science all makes sense and that's impressive, but nobody can actually stay on these diets long term. And it's a legitimate question. That's something we need to address. Uh, but we do have the DASHTI study here. This was a year long study in type 2 diabetics. And I do consider this one of the better ketogenic diets that was implemented. They really understood the importance of fat in the diet, um, and they had good compliance, and they show continued weight loss out to a year. They showed dramatic improvement in blood sugar initially that was maintained out past a year. So there is data out there, but um, we will hopefully um, have a study published uh, in January or February of 2017 um, based on a 400 patient clinical trial we're running right now in type 2 diabetics. It's just interim data, but I can tell you we have an absolutely transformative results um, using a ketogenic diet in type 2 diabetics, where we're reversing type 2 diabetes in over half the patients on our program in three months. And that's hardly enough time to even you know, see changes in A1C. And it's continuing out to a year, and we have incredibly high adherence, um, if you can believe it, close to 90% at a year. So people can stay on these diets with the proper support and guidance and, uh, and the proper formulation of the diet that, that ensures that it can be sustainable. And beyond diabetes and obesity, there are so many other areas here. You've already heard from two excellent speakers talk about this. Um, I mean, I've been doing ketogenic research now for 20 years, and uh, I'm just so excited. There's now um, just this burgeoning interest in, in ketogenic diets. So uh, it's really exciting time to be in the field of nutrition, and, and, and we're finally doing do justice, I think, to the ketogenic diet and studying it. There's just so many questions still out there uh, that we don't have answers to. So I'm going to skip through some of this um, and uh, talk a little bit about saturated fat because this is one of the areas where uh, there still remains a lot of confusion and concern even amongst advocates of the ketogenic diet. And so, you know, saturated fat ha has been villainized over the decades as being the cause of a lot of chronic disease. And it's been scrutinized, too. And the most recent meta-analysis of dietary saturated fat and risk for heart disease show no association. So why do we still keep focusing on it? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> In fact, if you decrease saturated fat and replace it with carbs, you actually increase your relative risk of having a coronary event. 
And that's not some bizarre dietary flip-flop. That's what the average American's actually done. They've decreased their saturated fat and replaced it with even more carbohydrate. But it's a little more um, complex than that. If you look at studies that have actually measured saturated fat levels in the body, whether that be in membranes or in the blood, and risk of heart disease, there, there is an, a very uh, consistent association with higher risk for heart disease. So if you have more palmitic acid or total saturated fatty acids in your blood, so you're accumulating saturated fat, that does increase your risk for heart disease. And here's four studies, I could show you a dozen more. Same with diabetes. If you accumulate more saturated fat, you're at higher risk for metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes. So that begs the question, well, what contributes to accumulation of saturated fat in the body? And the, you know, and the quick answer is, well, it's not dietary saturated fat. You know, we are not what we eat in all cases, and this is certainly one. It's actually, you know, and this is just basic metabolism here in biochemistry. Um, carbs control lipid metabolism, primarily through insulin. Insulin has profound effects on lipid metabolism. And so carbohydrates in the diet have a big impact on how we process fat. But it intrigued us. We wanted to actually measure saturated fat levels because we're feeding these ketogenic diets to people and we're feeding a, a very high levels of saturated fat in some cases. So this was one study where we fed three times as much saturated fat on the ketogenic diet as the low fat diet. And when we measured saturated fat levels in the blood, and we fractionated out the cholesterol ester, the phospholipid, the triglyceride molecules, and we looked everywhere. We've done animal studies, looked at tissue levels. Um, we always show saturated fat levels go down more on the ketogenic diet. So eat more saturated fat, but actually have less in your body. So it, on the surface, it seems completely counterintuitive or paradoxical. But again, the, the explanation is if you're, on a, in a, if you're eating a ketogenic diet, it goes back to some of the basic concepts we've been saying, you switch over to burning almost exclusively fat and ketones for fuel, and that includes saturated fat. And we validated this in three human studies under weight maintenance, weight loss uh, conditions. It's a very robust result. So the paradigm here it goes something like this, where uh, if you're eating saturated fat, you have a nice marbled steak and getting a nice dose of saturated fat, but if you, you typically eat that with potato or rice and a roll and dessert, and you get the insulin response, and you're going to be more prone to store that saturated fat in your, in your body. On the other hand, if you ask the waiter to give me you know, some non-starchy vegetables, hold the potato, and maybe even add some steak butter to the steak, uh, suddenly um, you're in a different metabolic state. Insulin's muted dramatically and you're continuing to burn fat. And it's very hard to imagine saturated fat having any harmful effects in the body if it's promptly being converted to CO2 and water. And that's what's essentially happening on a ketogenic diet. So the, the point here is that the processing of saturated fat in the body is highly dependent on the carbs that are consumed with it. So we aren't what we eat, we are what we save from what we eat. And really carbohydrates control lipid metabolism at that level. And it's also at the level of, on a more individual level, it's, it's the level of carb tolerance a person has too. If you're more carb intolerant, you're gonna be more prone to that storing that fat than a, than than a person who's more carb tolerant. So let's quickly, in the last uh, five or six minutes, just talk a little bit about the athlete story. So, um, you know, it, it's just been gospel that carbs, athletes need carbs. It's an obligate nutrient. If you don't eat a high carbohydrate diet before, during, after exercise, you're, you're not optimizing your, you know, your performance and recovery. And finally, we're challenging that seriously. There's, there's a few books out there that are all excellent that I would recommend. I just want to maybe call out Tim Noakes, who uh, arguably one of the most prolific sports scientists uh, ever. He's from South Africa, MD, PhD. 
uh, for mo al almost all his career, studied carbohydrate metabolism and wrote the book Lore of Running, which touted all the virtues of a high carbohydrate diets for athletes. It's regarded by the athletes as the, the, the Bible. Uh, and he um, is quite an accomplished athlete himself, having run several ultra events and done quite well. But as he um, got into middle age, um, he developed type 2 diabetes. He had a very strong history of type 2 diabetes in his family and could not outrun the type 2 diabetes. And that inspired him to try a, a ketogenic diet. And ha he had a very you know, transformative experience to it and now has been an incredibly strong advocate for ketogenic diets and has caused nothing short of a revolution in South Africa and beyond. He's also gotten himself into a bit of trouble uh, with a lawsuit and, and some other problems. And I just really feel for the guy because um, it's so unfair uh, that he's been, um, you know, at the, at the end of all that uh, misplaced uh, um, aggression and, got, you know, just stubbornness to, to hold on to the status quo. But this has really, um, up to this point, been primarily a grassroots movement. So you've got a lot of athletes within the ultra-endurance community who are adopting this. And these are just quickly three, three athletes who uh, are, are really quite elite ultra-athletes, uh, meaning they, they run events that are triathlons and beyond, so 50-mile, 100-mile runs. This was on the left there, Tim Olson won the Western States Endurance Run. I actually had our lab group out there trying to take blood from these guys and learn a little bit about how, what makes them tick. Uh, but he, he actually set a course record that year. Uh, you definitely can't see the time there unless you've got perfect vision, but it was 14 hours and 46 minutes. It was, I mean, this is just unbelievable physical um, torture really to, to finish this type of race but he left or he crossed that finish line looked like he ran around the block Zach Bitters one of the um, uh, most impressive ultra runners he just set the 100 mile track um, record on a ketogenic diet uh, 11 hours and 47 minutes he kept running and set the 20 or the 12 hour distance record and Mike Morton uh, in his early 40s now is setting 100-mile um, records as well. Uh, he's a major sergeant, um, and uh, you know his, one of his accomplishments is the 24-hour distance record. And I, I know Mike pretty well. He, um, he also competed on back-to-back -back weekends and won 100-mile races on and he wanted to do it on a third weekend. We kind of talked him out of it. Like, there's a limit to what you can do. You know, ultra running, though, is it's kind of a, you know, it doesn't get a lot of media attention. It's not on TV and so forth. So I think if you, within the ultra community, this is very common now that, that people are aware of this. But this now kind of brings it into the mainstream a bit more. This, this last um, Tour de France, it became... Um, known that the first and second place finishers were low carb athletes. So that was kind of, you know, an interesting moment because, uh, you know, the Gatorades of the world, I think, are very threatened by this because they've been promoting their sugar water for decades and making billions and billions of dollars. Well, all this really intrigued us. Um, yeah, I've always had an interest in, in, in more of the sports performance side of things. Uh, so we did this study called FASTER where we, um, we basically convinced a group of elite ultra runners to come to our lab and take, take them through a pretty invasive battery of tests. We published one of the first studies last year. I'll just quickly run through uh, the results in that paper. First of all, it was just 10... Ten athletes that were uh, on a traditional high-carb diet and ten on a low-carb diet. It's really important they were very equally matched in terms of their performance, their physical characteristics, even their VO2 max. So any differences here are, can really be attributed to their diet. And these athletes had all been on a ketogenic diet for almost two years. 
when we measured their peak fat oxidation rates, this is what we, this is what we found. So the peak fat oxidation rates were over twofold higher in the keto adapted athletes. And the highest rates ever reported in the literature are about one gram per minute. So this just shattered what we thought the max capacity to burn fat in humans was. And when we had them run on a treadmill for three hours, this is their um, fuel use. So typical 50-50 mix on the high carb athletes, but almost 90% of the fuel came from fat on the uh, ketogenic diet. And despite those dramatic you know, changes in fuel use in these athletes, when we measured their skeletal muscle glycogen, they were almost identical. Absolutely no differences in resting muscle glycogen or po immediate post or two hour post muscle glycogen. So I don't have time to talk about potentially why that would happen, but it does show profound adaptations in the human to maintain glycogen levels. Um, and even in, in, in the case where you are eating very little carbohydrate. And I think there's a lot of application here, though, beyond enhancing sport performance, because, yeah, it's nice if you can shave a few seconds off somebody's time or a few minutes. But I really see the um, important application here for our, our soldiers to make their physical and cognitive performance better, their enhance their resiliency to recover better. And I guess the, one of the last points here, and I'll, I'll, summer, I'll go into my summary, um, is this is anything but simple. You know, keto adaptation does not work like most drugs where you have a single target and it's very reductionist. Um, you know, keto adaptation changes the body in profound ways. So this is anything but simple to, to study and sort out. So if you like to kind of know exactly how something's working, you're going to be very disappointed in trying to understand how a ketogenic diet works because there are a lot of changes going on metabolically and, phys and, and physiologically within humans as they adapt to a ketogenic diet. So in summary, I think the main point is we're eating too many carbs and um, we gotta cut back. I mean, there are a few of us that are lucky and we can eat a lot of carbs and we maintain health and that's great. So, you know, carbs are great if you can tolerate them. But we have to understand that's kind of the basis. Get the carbs down to, to a level below which people can tolerate them. And, and that, you know, that, that kind of is very broad, but we're now learning ketogenic diets are kind of the ultimate low carb diet, um, do have some unique benefits. And a lot of this may be attributed to these new roles of ketones that we've talked about. So you know, on a practitioner level, where do you start? I mean, um, it's a little tricky, I mean, because everybody's carb tolerance is different, and I, I, I think you've got to find that level of carb tolerance that works for every person. It might be a carb level below which you're in ketosis, but not everybody be, needs to be in ketosis. Uh, it might be a carb level below which you keep all the signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome at bay, a carb level below which you're converting it to fat, and we're working on some actual biomarkers that are pretty sensitive to that metabolic process. So as of today, though, we don't have a lot of good objective markers to be able to do that um, effectively, but that, that's where I think personalized nutrition really needs to focus on is getting the carbs right. So I'll stop there. I think I'm a little bit over time. I apologize, and uh, thank you. I hope um, we get some great questions.